in today's show. We're looking back at the Utah Jazz. A surprising season? What does it mean for the future? We'll figure out what we know. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter, as always, at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. We're here to look at the Utah Jazz and their season. Just a couple of things. The playoffs, the Boston Celtics advanced today. We had the Milwaukee Bucks somehow losing. Well, not somehow, they got smashed by the Miami Heat. We've got the Knicks beating the Cavs. So we've only got two series left. We've got the Lakers and Grizzlies with the Lakers with a 3-2 lead and the Warriors Kings with the Warriors with a 3-2 lead. So some really interesting series, some upsets, obviously, right across the board, setting up some pretty cool and uh, intriguing second round matchups. Out of the second round matchups that are set, what do I think is going to happen? Putting myself on the spot because I haven't actually thought about it, but I'll do it now. I think, well, I, I mean, originally I picked Phoenix over Denver. I had Phoenix over Denver in six. I'm going to push that to seven. I just, Phoenix, they're just putting, there's just no depth at all. And Denver was, I think, pretty solid most of the time there. I did have Philadelphia over Boston, I think. I'm not sure how confident I feel with that with Embiid's injury, but I think that'll push to seven. And then you got New York, Miami. I, ooh, that's tough. Look, Miami was bad all season until they just dominated the um, the Bucks, and then Randall got hurt in that last game for the Knicks, who were awesome against the Cavs as well. That's a tough one for me, that series. I think that's probably going to be Miami in six, but I don't know. I don't, I don't, know if, I don't feel good about that one. And then, of course, we don't know about the Warriors, Lakers, Grizzlies, and Kings as to what that matchup's going to be. But let's talk Utah Jazz. Orny. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's look at what this team looked like. Who Everyone thought they'd be dreadful. Man, they're going to be tanking all season, not drafting any of their players. They're going to be all gone before the start of the season. And they started out really well. Yes, they did end up shipping out some players, but it's also another great illustration of making moves in your fantasy draft based on hypotheticals that don't happen. Well, I'm not. Jordan Clarkson's definitely gone. They're not going to play him, except he started all season. All right, Mike Conley, they're going to send him somewhere else and he's not going to be useful. Well, that's just not true. There's no chance Kelly Linick plays a role in this team. Not true. It's really hard to it's really hard to predict the tanking stuff or these expectations that you have. And, and I think a general rule should be, if you're making a move in a fantasy league, a pick up a trade, a draft pick, based on what you think might happen in terms of a real life trade, it's just really not likely to happen. Like the chances of you hitting on that are so, so minuscule until you get two, three days before the trade deadline, you have two, three stash guys that you look at, and that's really about it. I think we got we get taught that lesson every year. I think it was illustrated pretty significantly by um by this team. 37-45, the Jazz. They had a net rating of negative 0.9. That was 22nd in the NBA. 10th best offense, which is, again, staggering. That's a real testament to Will Hardy and what he was able to do with this squad. And, of course, the play, mainly, of Larry Market and Defense, 24th. Their best lineup of players who played over 100 possessions and remained on the team to end the season was a very interesting lineup. Horton Tucker, Abaji, Markkinen, Olinik, and Kessler. Really intriguing that that's the lineup they started a lot of the time. And that a lot of that came, well, all of it came post-trade deadline, obviously, because their best lineups had Conley or Vanderbilt or Beasley in them, and they were all traded. But no Clarkson there because he didn't play a lot of that time. But an interesting lineup. It was a plus 9.8. They had some moments that group, and we're going to talk about all those players individually. In terms of their cap space, they've got $41 million in cap space likely coming up because there's a few big situations. And the biggest one probably is going to be Jordan Clarkson and his player option, who we expect will decline that player option. He does really like being with the Jazz. The Jazz love him, but I don't think they'll be prioritizing bringing him back. I expect Clarkson to go somewhere else. There's also Taylor Horton Tucker, Rudy Gay, and Damian Jones, all with player options. I expect Gay picks that up because he's not getting $6.9 million somewhere else. Damian Jones probably picks that up. Horton Tucker, about $11 million. It's only 22. Taylor Horton Tucker, he might decline that. He showed a little bit down the stretch there. 
He might decline that, but I think he'll be back. And then Juan Toscano Anderson also is an unrestricted free agent. There's also a significant non-guarantee on, as I hit the microphone, a significant non-guarantee on Kelly Olynyk's contract. It's only $3 million out of the $13 million guaranteed or out of the $12 million guaranteed. So there's always a wave possibility there. Plus there's the guys they signed at the end, Vernon Carey Jr., Luka Shamanich, and Chris Dunn, who are all non-guaranteed for next season. I expect Dunn and Shamanich at least will be back um, next season. In terms of the NBA draft, they do have the ninth best lottery odds. The most likely spot, 50% chance of them finishing in the draft is at pick nine. And my mock draft ADP database would suggest that will be Anthony Black out of Arkansas. They've also got two other first round picks. Pick 16 would mock them with Jet Howard. And pick 28 is, well, this guy's moved up on a lot of mock drafts recently. I've got to go upgrade that, up, update that database because a couple of the guys that I use in the in the database have put out new mocks. I've got to go update it. But Bilal Kalabali, um, Victor Wembanyama's teammate over for Mets 92, he has moved up a little bit into the top 20 in some mocks. So he's yeah, be likely available there at pick 28. Question comes through from Karch Hinkley. A lot of questions like this one. So we're just going to cover it here. Will Lowry continue this production? Lowry Marketing. Now we're going to talk about that in a second, but that is the common thing because he was obviously a big target of me and big target of people listening to this show because he was incorrectly ranked and ADP'd all over the place. I was getting him 50s, 60s as that sort of option, but nobody expected what he did. And I think we have to look at what he did, and we'll talk about it in a second, but there is risk of, of efficiency drop because it sort of came out of nowhere. He did bump his usage. It wasn't sky high, but he did bump his usage. Still complete lack of defensive stats, but he was able to shoot at an insanely high level. And if there's any sort of level of reduction there, and the fact that the matter with him as well is down the stretch of a lot of games, they didn't go to him huge amounts. He didn't like just dominate the ball and dominate possession with super high usage. He really was able to get to where he was through just elite efficiency. And he was awesome. Don't get me wrong with any of that, but I, I don't know if there's an extra gear. And while, while I do expect that he'll be strong and he'll be picked probably second round, and I wouldn't think he's going to fall outside the third round, it's very, very far from a guarantee that that level of efficiency steps up. And if he goes from a 50% shooter back to a 47% shooter, might not say much to you, but it's enough to drop him 15, 20 spots. It can be. If there's just any sort of little dip in that elite level of efficiency, then it probably drops him off. So he's good. He's their best player. But like, who knows? There are a lot of different things that can sort of happen. A lot had to happen right for him. Is he a player? And this is what we always look at when we're talking dynasty. Is he a player that you feel comfortable? You are my number one. We are building around you as our number one moving forward. I think I'm not quite there with him yet, but I'm not far off it. He'd be an awesome number two. Like, is he better as a build around number one than a Christos Porzingis would be? Or is he slide more into the Porzingis is a best number two sort of situation? We just did the Wizards yesterday. And I think that's probably why we look at him and go, yeah, you can do this next season. Two years' time, three years' time, you'd probably expect a marginal drop-off from Mark. But again, he was impressive, so maybe not. But really, really impressive stuff from him this season. I just have some concerns about the way that that is um, able to hold. Today's episode and the Nissan Elect Most Electric Player of the Week is brought to you by the all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria. Well, because we're talking Utah Jazz, and the Utah Jazz, of course, aren't playing at the moment, I'm going to give the Nissan Player of the Week to Larry Markkinen, a guy that was honestly considered a throw-in in the Donovan Mitchell trade. Colin Sexton was thought to be the guy they wanted. The draft picks were there, and Markkinen was matching salary. But he came in, was immediately their best player, and was an all-star, and led this team to surprising numbers all season. Absolutely electric, smooth, powerful, smart, elegant. Markkinen brought it all, brought hope to this Utah franchise who was transitioning to a new era, and it was just a fantastic season from him. And much like the 2023 Nissan Aria, Larry Markkinen also pit packs pinto your seat power and premium intelligence. He's not an EV, but the Nissan Aria is. The all-new, all-electric 2023 Nissan Aria, the EV for people who love to drive. Shop now at nissanusa.com. Um, sometimes in life, things get tough. We know this. Better help is here for you. Sometimes you don't even know the best way to address the problems that you're having or you're having in your life, right? We look at getting the, the right help to improve yourself, which can be a lifelong process. And we're always growing. Our situation is always changing. We're always changing. And BetterHelp is someone who is there for you to help connect you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery wherever you are. 
it's great to be able to learn coping skills for whatever changes come up in your life to be able to balance yourself and move head head strong, head forward into those challenges that get thrown at you. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. That will bring us now to talk about the players. And of course, we will start talking about the players by talking about Lowry Market. And it was one of the, it, I'll say it's a surprise season, because it was. Was I massively surprised? Yes. But also, I think when I did my sleeper video, he was the cover picture. Because it's like, hey, what are we doing? Why is he being drafted so late? ADP 96, I believe that he started the fantasy draft process at about 120. He was ridiculous. He ended up 21st in category leagues, 32nd in points leagues. Played a lot of games. He's only 26. 66 games, 34 minutes, 26 usage. Average almost 26 points with three threes. 8.6 rebounds. My problem again, as I just said before, is the like lack of peripherals here. Under two assists, 0.6 steals, 0.6 blocks. He was able to get to where he was and be as good as he was by getting 26 usage. And we knew he'd get a usage bump. That's why I liked it, coming to this situation where he'd get more shots. But then he turned in 50% shooting, 39 from, the, from three and 88 from the line. Just unbelievable numbers. And as I said, if that 50 goes to 47, if 39% goes to 37, then we're talking maybe 24 points and 2.7 triples, which is still really good. But it brings you from 21st to 32nd or to 35th or to 40th or whatever. Not bad, but where does he get better from here? His advanced stats were amazing. EPM 96th percentile. Estimated wins 97th. Darko plus 1.6. LeBron 80th percentile. Look at that graph of the improvement for him over the last two seasons and how unbelievable his Darko has shot up to just literal all-star levels. Unbelievable stuff. But again, I think the Darko ranking in 58th in the league is a sobering reminder of that, yes, he put up some good numbers, but does that make him actually a top 25 player that he was in fantasy this season? And I would suggest, well, Darko doesn't tell us this necessarily, I think that that is a reasonable, a reasonable thing to say, well, he's good, but is this reliable? Is it reliable? Had some injuries down the end of the season, which, of course, were 100% fake. Fake, 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 fake. That's not true. He did have a hand problem. He could have played more games, though. So I don't think we need to worry too much about that. His fantasy points graph was pretty strong. He had a couple of missed games in the middle there, but he was, he was useful. He was awesome, especially early on. And it's really hard to complain too much about him. Again, the question is going to be, replicability. I don't see any reason that he couldn't do what he did again. I do expect a marginal drop-off. I would find it hard for him to get better than this. If they find themselves lottery luck, pick two, pick three, yeah, an addition of Scoot, an addition of Brandon Miller, an addition of Victor Wembanyama, the fact that Markinen as the number one option was still only 26 usage, and if a higher usage player comes in, and he might settle at 24, and then you've got to balance in the efficiency drops that might happen. That's a little bit of where I have my concerns. And again, if you're building a franchise, building a team, do you look at that and go, our guy sorted, let's go get everyone around him versus, oh, he's really good and we love what he's doing now, but we love to get somebody else. We love to get more of a self-generator, which marketing really isn't. And that's where you have some level of concern where as a, as a big man, you can be a non-self-generator as a big man, but make it up by averaging 1.7 blocks and getting a sneaky three and a half assists or one steal. He doesn't do any of that. That's that's part of my overall level of concern. In terms of, no, I'm not concerned, but my, I think you know what I mean. Anyway, my concern of where does it go from here and how long does it stay at this level? This guy was second on this team. He only played 22 games, and that is Chris Dunn. Came in towards the end of the season after they traded away Mike Conley and Jordan Clarkson got hurt. He was 70th in category leagues, 89th in points leagues. Now, the total numbers are bad because he played 22 games. 297th in Cat League's totals, 299th in points leagues. He's 29 already. He played 22 games, 26 minutes, 20% usage. So these numbers are fantastic. 13 points, a three, four and a half boards, five and a half rebounds, a steal. He shot 54 from the field, 47 from three, 77 from the line. And while I use this for injuries a lot, let's use this for Chris Dunn now. Fake, 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 fake. This is bullshit. He's not a 47% three-point shooter. He's not even a 54% shooter from the field. He's not a 26-minute-a-night player, I don't think. 
we have to remember that end of the season, there was Conley was traded, but there was no Clarkson, who might not be there this season. There was also no someone of uh, Colin Sexton. He was out as well. And while Dunn has this non-guaranteed $2.5 million contract for next season, and he is a very viable backup, I think we'd be tra- treating him more like Dennis Smith in Charlotte, great defensive guy, can come in, step into bigger minutes if needed. But he's not the answer. He's not that, he's not that sort of player. So while this is all good, and his impact stuff, LeBron loved him. His EPM was pretty strong. His Darko, not quite as encouraging. Remember, Darko is something that takes what you did, but also tries to translate it forward-looking. It doesn't look at this and go, wow, what a turnaround. But we've got yeah, big, big stuff coming from Chris Dunn. And the fact that he is 29, he didn't sign until March, should get you that understanding of, yeah, he's probably not in the future plans of a team. His fantasy points grab doesn't tell us much, apart from towards the end of the season, like that's when he played. He was given big minutes because Sexton Clarkson injured. And then you had a bunch of other guys. So sort of, you know, even Horton Tucker, I think, missed some time down the stretch there as well. He, he was pretty strong. He was pretty impactful. He was really useful in 12-team leagues for a big stretch of time. But I don't really know that that's something we care about too much moving forward. Kelly Linick. Pretty staggering to me that Linick was being drafted where he was. I was picking him around the 100 mark in a lot of drafts. I was told, and I told you guys, that you expect him. they expect him to start and play some significant minutes. And a lot of the panic around Olenek was, A, they're going to trade him, and B, he's going to get benched for Walker Kessler. And this is why it's really important to be really cautious about where you get your information. Because yes, Kelly Olenek might be listed as a center on fantasy sites. You might think that he's a center. He played power forward exclusively. Jared Vanderbilt was their center, and Walker Kessler was their center. So people would just go, well, they're just going to bench Olenek for Kessler. That's what's going to happen. And of course, it never did because the shooting and passing ability that Olenek brings um, will hyper useful. Now, he does have that non-guarantee. He had a $12 million contract, $3 million guarantee, so they can waive him at any point. He was 73rd in category leagues, 118th in points, and he clearly busted through that ADP. And you know that I was big on him, having him, drafting him. But also, when I saw he was on the waiver wire all season, add him, and you would have got great value out of that. But he is 32. He played 68 games, 29 minutes, 17 usage, 12 points, 6 rebounds, almost 4 assists, 0.9 steals and half a block. Now, in the past, he's been a much better shot block than that. He also shot really, really well. Also, his um, advanced numbers were all strong across EPM and Darko and LeBron. Positive impact player, as he has been for big stretches of his career. Look, if you look at that graph, he's been a positive guy basically since year two, year three. Just re- amazing stuff. Who's a solid contributor and doesn't probably get the probably doesn't get the respect as a positive con- contributing player as he should. We know he's had some big runs, like in post-All-Star break with Rockets. That's one of those key ones. But they got him as part of the deal for Boyan Bogdanovich. Probably maybe could have done a little bit better there, but Olenek provided good value for this team. He was really helpful in uh, getting marketing to where he was and also getting Walker Kessler to where he needed to be. But is he on this team next season? I don't know. He's useful, clearly, but... They're making the moves to get off of guys. If they lose Clarkson, they could move on from him. They could open up things and really start to to wind into a full re- rebuild this season. I think that's a, a huge possibility for Cali. And he's 32. So a lot of whether he's going to be draftable or have value this season is going to come down to what does their roster look like. He's good, but he shouldn't preclude you from changing the roster or upgrading the roster or upgrading his position or anything like that. Shouldn't have any, any like worries about him putting a handbrake on that. That's just not realistic. So he loved what he did, but I don't know that that's going to stick. He started out really strong. He had those ankle injuries in the middle of the season, and I think we all know this if we had him in fantasy. He was bad. He struggled with that ankle problem, and look at how his EPM dropped way off when he had the ankle issue. And then he got healthy and was back to being the same player again, basically. Showing again that ankle injuries, while you can come back from them early, they can have a lingering effect on your on-court production. And I think Alinek was a pretty strong uh, indicator of that this season. Today's episode is also brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. And it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right. The first time around, just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know that the part will fit all your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Broncos country. 
Let's ride. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to US customers. Eligible items only and exclusions apply. Let's look at the man on the street, Jordan Clarkson. J-O-R-D-A-N-C-L-A-R-K-S-O-N. Another guy that I was pretty interested in drafting late. A lot of people were telling me there's no way. They will move on from him straight away. They will start their rookie, Oshai Baji. They valued him so much to get him in that trade. And Clarkson's just not worth it. Now, my thought on Clarkson preseason was he would come off the bench. And he would be really strong as a points and threes guy. I didn't, for a second, imagine what we got out of him. 79th ranked player in points. 115th in category leagues. 131 ADP, so beat that number. He's 31. He's got a player option that I think he'll decline. He played 33 minutes a night with 27 usage. 21 points, two and a half threes, four and a half assists. Shot 34 from three, 44 from the field. Now, he was obviously a negative impact field goal player. And you know, the low rebounds and the low steals are annoying, but good assists, good threes, good points, good free throws, good usage, good minutes. Consistency was great. We love that. Impact-wise, pretty strong. Darko, 95th ranked player in the NBA. LeBron was the only one that hated him. He was 16th percentile compared to starters. That's really interesting. Well, EPM and estimated wins really liked him too. And you see the Darko stuff, how negative he was as a player most of his career until like the last three seasons where he's really stepped it up to be a positive contributor. And part of that is better shot selection, understanding what his role needs to be. Do I ramp up when necessary? Do I pull it back when necessary? Shout out to Dylan Brooks. Understanding what his role is and how he can best help a team. And he has really matured into that player. And I think that gives him significant appeal as a free agent, like fitting on a team. Like, can you start? Can you come off the bench? Can you facilitate? Can you score? Can you shoot threes? Can you drive? There's a lot of positives for what Clarkson's been able to develop. And he is 31. So we don't expect him big stuff from him again. And is he draftable next season? I don't know. That's going to depend a lot on the team that he's on. And his talent level and who he is as a player and his age, you would think that he's probably got one, maybe two draftable seasons left. Maybe. I would say it's probably more likely one than two. He did have, again, a bunch of fake injuries towards the end of the season. Oh, that's not, he had a thumb issue where he couldn't catch the ball, but you know, I think he probably could have come back at some point, but they were sitting guys out. He was just really solid all season, and not much more that needs to be said about Jordy Clarkson, I don't think. Good positive impact guy. Did drop off a little bit towards the end, but really just encouraging season from him. Now, you want to talk the opposite of encouraging? Let's talk about Colin Sexton. Now, there are a lot of excuses about Colin Sexton for this season, and I think it's important to remember a few things because... With the way that, that I work and the things that I do and I read and I see, there can be misinformation spread a lot. Does it change the course of the world? No, it doesn't. But it's still out there. So you can talk about Jordan Clarkson, Jordan Clarkson sorry, or Colin Sexton, and you can, the excuses can be made. I can say, hey, I don't really like Colin Sexton as a player. I never have. And I don't really think he's a point guard. And the excuses will be, well, he's just come back from an ACL. So you've got to give him time to recover. He didn't. He didn't come back from an ACL. He tore his meniscus in, I think, November 2021, which is like a six-month injury. So he was absolutely ready and 100% ready to go for the start of the season. And that, that's it. Like, it wasn't a torn ACL, which can take 18 months to get back to yourself. It was a torn meniscus. And honestly, yes, the hamstring issues were a big problem for him, multiple hamstring problems. That limited him to 48 games this season. But what I saw from Sexton is basically what I've pretty much always seen from him. He was 186th in category leagues, 175th in points leagues. He had an ADP of 86. And I'm not going to lie to you because I was around pick 90, 95. I was totally okay with drafting him because I thought you've had nine months recovery, 10 months recovery from a six month injury. You're fine. You will come in as the, the guy that I think I thought was the prize piece from the trade. And you will start next to Mike Conley immediately. That is what I thought would happen. But it didn't. He was battling Malik Beasley for minutes off the bench behind Jordan Clarkson. And he got a couple of starts when guys were hurt. And then when Mike Conley got hurt or got traded, he moved in the starting lineup and pinged his hamstring anyway. And I don't think he's a point guard. And all of the same concerns that I have with Sexton raise his head. And I, and I think it was on the um, Roto World NBC Edge mock draft. And I picked him at like pick 95. And um, I'm pretty sure uh, Matt Straup was hosting it. And he was like, man, Josh, do you really like you know, Colin Sexton at that pick? I was like, no, I don't. I don't like him as a player whatsoever. No interest in him as a player whatsoever. But I thought they were going to give him a lot of shots and he's going to get a big opportunity to run this offense. And they didn't. And if he doesn't get that, he's no good. That's a lot of words for me to say he's no good. He's not no good. And he can be useful from a stats perspective. But on a team looking to go somewhere, I don't think he's the answer. And we'll be looking for future projection value of someone 
that's really important for how long they last in a sizable role. 24 minutes, 14 points, a three, two rebounds, three assists, 0.6 steals. He shot 39% from three. He's turned himself into a very good three-point shooter. 82 from the line. He's quite good at that. But it's the lack of rebounds, assists, steals, and blocks, the lower three-point volume, the now two years really bothered by lower body injuries, knee and hamstring, and the fact that I just don't think that he is a huge impact winning player. The advanced stuff does not like him. EPM negative. Darko, 315th, bad. LeBron, 9th percentile. You look at that graph, like there was some improvements there before he got hurt, but he's never even approached the zero on Darko. And I think this is, he's only 24. He could definitely get, he could definitely get better, but all the stuff from him at Alabama, the stuff from him in Cleveland, the stuff from him in Utah has been the same stuff. Can you be a facilitator? Can you defend? Can you ever rebound? Can you be a volume three-point shooter? Can you be a, a driver of efficient offense? And to me, the answer's been in a, a pretty resounding no most of the time. There was that little stretch in Cleveland before um, Darius Garland really broke out where he was really scoring well and scoring efficiently. And that's all well and good. But it doesn't necessarily make you a great player or a great prospect moving forward. So depending on what they do with their team... He could be in, and I could be back in on drafting him top 100 again for next season because he's likely to start, play 31 minutes, average 20 points. That is all distinctly possible. But when we're talking about longer-term value from him, I don't, I don't really see it. I just think there are too many struggle areas in what he does for me to get too excited about that. The guy that did start and played some minutes over him even when healthy towards the end of the season when Conley was gone was Taylor Horton Tucker, who is still remarkably young. For a guy to be out of his rookie contract and have the player option of his second contract coming up this season, he is 22. He was had an ADP of 142. I don't really know why. He finished 235th in category leagues, 174th in points leagues. But towards the end of the season, he was a, a must-roster player with everybody out. 65 games, 20 minutes, 25 usage, 11 points, a three, four assists, 0.6 deals, three rebounds. But 42 and 29 from the field and from three is rough. 75 from the line is rough. He showed some flashes, but I think what he also showed, you know, he's only 22. Remember that. Two years younger than Colin Sexton. So he's still like, there are going to be guys coming in. Chris Murray is going to be drafted this season older than Taylor Horton Tucker. When you look at what he's doing, you know, it's still two years away from where Sexton currently is now age-wise. But has there been any improvement in shooting from Horton Tucker at all? He has a lot of inconsistency with his offensive play. Defensively, he struggles quite a bit. He still remains really intriguing. But I think the times that we're going to look at him as fantasy relevant are going to be times where, oh, one to two people are out. He comes in, he puts up good numbers, they lose games, and then you're still always looking to upgrade that spot. I'm not ruling all this stuff out because he's still only 22. That is really young. The Darko stuff... It's been a solid improvement. He's getting better. He started out unbelievably with the Lakers with a couple of really huge games and then did drop off and became a massive negative. And then improved, picked it up, hung a little bit as a starting point guard, was okay. But I don't really see that as, you know, is he better than Colin Sexton? I don't know. Better passer, sure. Not more reliable as a scorer or a shooter, though. And we see that the numbers for him really spiked towards the end there when Clarkson was out, when Conley was traded. So he remains a conundrum. I imagine that he, him and the Jazz will look to come to an agreement on a contract. He might opt out and then sign for another like 330, 345 type contract. I could see that happening. But, you know, him and Sexton as your, are they both backups? You know, Clarkson's gone. Will Sexton start next to Abaji maybe? And then Horton Tucker gets 25 off the bench? It's possible but it's probably never going to be a consistent enough fantasy producer for us to care. Speaking of consistent fantasy producers or caring for that matter, Oshai Abaji, who was um, the lottery pick of the Cavs, came across in the trade for Donovan Mitchell and was a guy that, A, I didn't like them picking at that point in the draft. B, I hated his fantasy translations. C, I hated his prospects for this season. D, I think I'm totally justified in terms of what his production was this season. Now, I am in no means ruling out him being a positive NBA player. The advanced stats would tell me, Josh, you're wrong because they're all really bad and I think he was quite bad this season. He was, like a few of these players, much better when they started him towards the end of the season. But he was still 345, 5th in category leagues, not 5th, 345th in category leagues, 322 in points leagues. And he is older than Taylor Horton Tucker. 
He's a rookie who's 23. He just turned 23. He's going to be 23 and a half, obviously, by the start of next season. And my worry with someone like this, much like Corey Kispert yesterday, is what do you do outside of scoring? Eight points, one and a half threes. One and a half threes in 20 minutes is solid. But 15% usage? He required a lot of players to be out to, to even have any interest in shooting. He just didn't seem like he was going to do that. He's a guy that I think is going to hover around, like maybe best case, 20% usage at his peak seasons. Two rebounds, one assist, 0.3 steals. Now, 20 minutes a night is not starter level, but it's 67% of starter level. So we add 50% onto those numbers. Let's say it's 30 minutes. Let's translate this to 30 minutes. 12 points, two threes. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Three rebounds, 1.5 assists, 0.5 steals. That's not enough there. 36% from three is solid. 81% from the line doesn't get there. 42% overall shooting. Impact-wise, negative EPM, big negative Darko, 448th in the NBA. LeBron was pretty poor, and you can see that graph. Like, nothing spectacular. It took a lot of things to happen. No Clarkson, no Markinen. Alinek missed some time. Sexton out. And then he started to do better, and we see that on the fantasy points graph. You can see some better numbers. But when you see the red line being significantly higher than the blue line, that tells you his fantasy points per minute are really low. Low usage, low peripherals, low scoring. Towards the end, it started to get even to each other, but he would be a guy who could have 20 points on eight of nine shooting and everyone would froth him. Man, I can't believe they got this guy as part of the trade. Wow, what a future star we've got on our hands. And then as usual, when you're digesting media and socials and all that sort of stuff, they won't mention that he has three points on, one sh on two shots in the next game and played 25 minutes with one rebound because that's sort of what he was doing most of the season. We're not precluding him from becoming good, of course, but he's 23. So he is already behind the eight ball as a young player. The profile was never good coming out of Kansas. It's exactly the same as it was in Kansas as it is in the NBA where you struggle in a lot of those other peripheral categories. And that is just a losing proposition from a fantasy output perspective. For him to become a good fantasy player, which again, he started to put up some good numbers towards the end. It required everyone to be out and it was Horton Tucker and him and a little bit of a Linux putting up numbers. And you know, Damian Jones and Yudoka as a BUK. And Simonov, Simone Fontecchio and Lucas Sharmanich as the players next to him. You know, no Sexton, no Markinen, no Clarkson, no potential top five pick this season in the mix. Top four pick. None of those guys there. So if you are hoping that he builds on what he did for a dynasty league, again, we all have biases. I just didn't like him as a draft prospect. I didn't buy into it. I didn't buy him as a fantasy draft prospect. Nothing that I saw changed my mind. He shot the ball very well, fairly well, 36% overall from three, improved as the season went on. But the lack of impact across other areas and the reluctance to get any usage in makes him a guy that I really doubt is going to be a fantasy impact player. Didn't really play at all to begin the season, which, again, if you're picking 23-year-olds in the draft, I assume that the reason you're doing that is you hope that they're NBA-ready. And when you barely play a single game in the first three months of the season, it's a little bit worrying. And then you start to get games and you're really a big negative nearly all season until you have some positive impacts towards the end. Again, I know a lot of Jazz people are really, really bullish on what he was able to do. Super positive on him as he moves forward. I could be wrong, but I, I, I don't buy him as a high-level fantasy contributor across multiple seasons. There will be moments where things happen and injuries happen and he has a little peak but nothing where I go, well, I'm very excited about what Abaji is going to do. There's not a huge amount of prospects to talk about on this team. So we are going to talk Damian Jones, who they've got three first-round picks obviously coming in, so things are going to change coming up. 361st, Damian Jones. He was actually drafted in 2% of leagues at pick 140 because at the start of the year, we didn't know whether, it was going to be, whether he was going to start next to Anthony Davis. That was the rumor coming out of Lakers training camp. He obviously didn't. He played 28 minutes a night, played 41 games, 12 minutes, averaged three points and three rebounds with half a block. He shot almost 60% from three on limited attempts. He's a guy that goes out there and occasionally flashes decent production, but never seems to be able to stick with it. And you can see, like, even towards the end of last season, I can't remember if that was with the Lakers or with the Kings. I think it was with the Kings. He started to become a slightly positive impact player. Now, it did start to drop off as this season went on, and then he really struggled when Kessler missed time down the end. Like, he didn't really do anything to suggest that he should get this role more, and his impact stuff was all pretty low. But he still remains marginally intriguing. And you can see, look, just barely playing at all with the Lakers. Played some games with the Jazz, but, you know, how much are we excited about it? The answer is not really at all. There's a lot of blue dots on this graph as well, just showing 
all the games that he didn't play. And the last guy that I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to go into in-depth the detail on Johnny Jujang or even Simone Fontecchio or even Luka Shamic, who I don't really think are NBA rotation players. This is a guy that they invested a first-round pick in, and it's Yudoka Azebuke. Now, I hated the pick when they made it. It didn't really make any sense, and he's had these ankle injuries, but also he's just... I don't think he's an NBA player. I don't know what they go, what's going to happen with him. He's 380th in category leagues, 14th in points leagues. He's 24. He played 20, 10 minutes in 36 games. Three and a half points, three rebounds, 0.4 blocks. He did shoot 82%, but you have minus three Darko. That's 495th. Barely anyone worse than that. LeBron didn't love him. EPM didn't love him. He barely played. Look at his fantasy points graph. He's just barely on the court. A first round pick that they could have done so much more with. I don't. He's too slow. He can't do anything offensively. He's too slow to move defensively. I just, I think he's going to be out of the NBA really, really soon, which is unfortunate for the guy, but I just don't really see it at all, unfortunately for him. So don't look at him. Like, I think they need to do more here, obviously, behind Walker Kessler. As I just realized, where's my Walker Kessler graph? I've got to go bring that up. Did I miss Walker Kessler? I did. What on earth happened? Well, that was almost a gigantic L for me, but I saved it. I went back. Found it, realized that I didn't talk about Walker Kessler. So let's talk about the runner-up. Runner-up, third place in Rookie of the Year. He was a complete revelation, I think, this season. One of those players that when we do our fantasy rookie translations, we do it and I go, oh, why is Walker Kessler coming out as a top 30 player? What's going on here? Can he stay on the court enough? Because if he can, these numbers translate unbelievably. And it turns out he can. He was, you don't see rookies that are this impactful as rookies. You don't. He was unbelievably good. And he did this while playing 23 minutes a night. 84th ranked player, 108th in points leagues, drafted ADP 41. There is a huge risk. In fact, I think it's almost definitely going to happen of him being drafted too high next season for a number of reasons. People will look at what he did as a starter, which was un- undoubtedly really good. 28 minutes a night, 11 points, 10 rebounds, 2.7 blocks, 72% shooting. He had 48% from the line, which is obviously horrific. The attempts aren't all that huge. It was only 12% usage as a starter, which is you know, obviously really low as well. But the numbers for him are going to be absolutely bumped because of turnovers. His numbers are going to be through the roof because of turnovers. Like if you look at his Yahoo rank, it will tell you that he was 50th for the whole season. So you're going to look at this and go, well, actually, if you look, you know, since he was a starter post-All-Star or you know, fe- February on, he was actually a top 25 player. He's going to go second round in some drafts, and I don't know that that's correct. Well, actually, let me rephrase. I think it's correct that he's going to go in those spots. Do I think that that ends up being the right decision? And I don't know that it is. This doesn't take away from the fact that he's already a really impactful defender, and I actually think he's going to start to shoot threes more. He didn't really hit any. He did shoot at 33%, but barely hit any. 23 minutes, 9 points, 8 rebounds, 2.3 blocks, 72 from the field. 87th percentile EPM, 68th overall player in Darko, 83rd percentile LeBron, 5.9 wins as a rookie is unheard of for estimated wins. These are unbelievably good numbers. And look at that Darko graph. Like, started out as all rookies do. Hey, we don't really know what he's going to do. And now all of a sudden, hey, no, he's actually really strong and a positive impact player as we move forward. But if you look at his stats set, and this translates across what he did as a starter, as a bench guy, it's the same sort of stuff. A double-double player, a two-blocks player, and that's it. That's it. High field goal percentage on low volume. Bad free throws on low volume. Will he ever be able to be a 20% usage guy? Almost no way. Will he have some seasons where he might get to three blocks? Yeah. Really, really easily. But you also got to remember when looking at that dynasty-wise is the blocks will often peak year four, year three, and then they start to decline. Foul trouble might be a problem for him as well. I had that concussion at the end of the season. So while they are... The metrics favor him, especially if you're including turnovers. They will show him up. And I will get this question when I do projections next season. Josh, why do you actually have Walker Kessler as the 13th best player? Someone will say that to me because I don't know how it's going to come out. It might project that way because of low turnovers, sky-high field goals, big blocks, good rebounds. And that will push someone really high. It's the Rob Williams factor. Almost the exact same player as Rob Williams. The people tell, well, actually, you know, he was actually ranked better than Luka Doncic. Which is foolish. Because I just don't think, I just don't think that's a realistic representation of what the fantasy value is. Threes, assists, steals, free throws are all going to be bad and hard to recover from. Big numbers in other areas, and to say that he wins you blocks on his own, I don't think is true. You probably need thirty blocks a week, 
probably need 30 blocks a week, 35 blocks a week. Yeah, is that right? No, yeah. Let's say, let's say if you win, if you get 35 blocks a week from a fantasy team in a standard setting, you probably win that. You probably win that category. He might give you seven. He might give you eight as a general rule for it. He might give you 10. Still got to get 24, 25 more to guarantee you that win. So the statement could be he wins it on his own. He's not 100% correct. You still need to pay attention to that category because you get into a situation where you go, I've got blocks wrapped up and then you get everyone else averaging 0.4 blocks. It doesn't lead to wins. It doesn't lead, it leads to squandering that player. So he becomes a really interesting guy. He is 22, so slightly older as a rookie. There are limitations of him compare, like just view him as like a Rudy Gobert even. That's, that's a, you know, obviously the Utah connection's there to make it easier for you. But the impact on those certain categories and then big negatives in other categories is reasonable. And he might not even, be, even become the high, the, the usage player that Rudy was, where he could get to 16, 17, 18%. Maybe Kessler can't get there. And I think that might lead to ranking slaves pushing him a little bit too high in how they view him. So I'd be really cautious about that in dynasty formats. He's going to be good. Like He is going to be probably a top 50, top 60 guy for multiple seasons. Six seasons, five seasons. But compare and contrast him to one of the leading block guys the two leading block guys over the last couple of years, those two guys that we look at prototypical blocks players in Miles Turner and Jaron Jackson. Both of those guys have way more offensive upside, way more shooting upside, and are much better free throw shooters. Can Kessler's role is, can you become Hassan Whiteside? Can you become Rudy Gobert? And even then, the value of those players as turn first round, second round players or yeah, back-end second-round players is really, really dependent on how else you build your team. And I'm not saying this to shit on Kessler because I am a big fan of his. I had him basically in my top three rookies from immediately in the season. First time I did it, which was like December, I had him there. And I think that he's going to be very, very good. He's already very good, but is there actual huge fantasy growth upside here? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Fantasy points-wise, he's going to have some big games. You can see some pretty big ups and downs there in the graph. But overall, really strong. He's going to be inside the top 100 next season whatsoever. He will go, without doubt, in a category league in the first four rounds. Almost definitely in the first three and probably in the first two. But I just have to warn that if you do take him there, you are basically punting points. And then you put yourself in deficits in a lot of areas. And that can be tough to recover from. So that's part of my concern with the overvaluation of Walker Kessler. Unbelievably impactful. That graph's ridiculous for a rookie. To be that good, that early, that soon. With The growth can come. He can shoot threes. Will he ever take enough of them or be enough of an offensive guy to matter? Can he get to 17, 18 usage? I don't know about that. Can he average three blocks a game for a season? Yes. Yes, really easily. But that's not that's not a seven-year prospect. That's not something where you're going to average three a game for seven years in a row. It's really hard to do that in the NBA. And that does do it for me talking about Walker Kessler. Sorry for forgetting him until the end, and I'm sure I'm going to get comments. Hey, Josh, you're talking about your Dirk Razor Buka. You haven't even talked about Walker Kessler. Well, there he is. We did talk about him eventually. Follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you're here on YouTube, thumb it up. Leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.